I mean, there are some people, some tribes of people that uh, believe that photography was wrong and that, it, you know, every time a picture is taken of you, a part of your soul gets snatched from you. Oh, that's weird. Kind of it sounds like Instagram to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. That's why. <laughs> that's why you don't have Instagram. Huh? That's why I don't have Instagram because it takes from me. Did we land on the moon? I wasn't there. Good answer. <laughs> Neither was Buzz Aldrin, if you he asked that guy. He said we. <laughs> I wasn't there. Neither was Buzz. I think we're becoming more wicked in the church and, of course, outside the church. And that's why there's a need for there to be an end. In this episode, I have my friend Matt Gray go on to explore some of the ideas we've been discussing on the show recently. We eventually get into technologies like the new Apple Vision Pro, central bank digital currencies, and Neuralink. We debate whether these are signs of the end and what that even means from a biblical point of view. We had fun and clash like good friends should. Hope you enjoyed the episode. It's funny because we, we were talking about how design directs behavior. Okay. Design and, directs behavior. Yes. Direct. That's an mm-hmm. intense verb there. Okay. Go on. I, I actually, I'm really proud of the usage of that in, in my sponta- spontaneous usage of it just now, because I actually think that's the case, right? If you're, hmm. we were talking about architecture. Um, if you're in a nice cathedral, you're probably not going to be annoying, loud, rambunctious. You're probably going to be very tame, very hmm. respectful, reverent. It kind of, now, for what, why, why that is, I don't know. It's because you're in the midst of greatness. That's not every single person, of course, but there is that general expectation and response. Design directs responses. It, it, it directs your responses, in a sense. And it's not just like architecture, but you can carry that out to music. You were talking about that before, right? It certainly influences it. I don't know that I would agree to use the word direct. You think but that's more too strong, influence, I think. Too absolute. It, I think nothing can direct me. It can influence me, but ultimately, because I have the ability to decide what I do with what's in front of me, Take external your thoughts stimulus. Captive. Sure. Yeah. Be wise it, about any external stimulus. There's a distance between stimulus and response, and I have the ability to respond to what I'm stimulated consciously, by. not. Yeah impulsively so i could walk into and i have recently in the last few months walked into the most some of the most beautiful cathedrals in the world and it did evoke in me an awe in some ways it did evoke in in me some sort of disgust and we can talk about that in in another way but i had to decide what to do with those feelings do i walk in and take pictures of everything because i'm engaging with the space Or does my body prostrate itself in awe, depending on what kind of cathedral I go in? So I can decide. Take me to one of these places. What did you go see? What's the specific space? So most recently, I went to the National Cathedral in Washington D.C. It's the second, I think, the second largest cathedral in the in the United States. Uh, Both of the largest. One is in, uh, I think, it's St. John's, is in New York. And then the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Both of them are Episcopal. Those where pre- presidents attend, have historically maybe attended? I'm sure. If they're yeah. the largest, I, I imagine so. Yeah. They have beautiful organs in, in there. And then uh, they're, they're so widely known and praised for their architecture, their gorgeous buildings. But being in there, when you walk in, I walked in during a service. So during the week, you pay $16 to go in. And I've been trying to stretch wait, the Wait, dollar. wait, wait, what? You have to pay to you go You have to pay this. to go into the National Cathedral. To go to church? Not on a Sunday. Okay. So when I found as that there was a service okay, as a tourist. that I could attend. Still weird, but that's... It is a little weird, but whatever. Maybe that's how they make money, because even going on a weekend, there weren't that many people for how large it was. So tithes and all of that, I don't know if they make... And what they need to survive. But anyway, walking in uh, during the week is very different than walking in during the service, where you hear the litur- liturgy, where you hear the music fill that space. That's the, yes, that, that's it. 
Funny enough, okay, here's a a little uh, insight into that building. Somewhere on that building, I couldn't find it, is Darth Vader. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, you know how there's gargoyles and different uh, statues throughout or likenesses throughout? You could probably find it, I'm sure. I just didn't know. It was such a large building on the outside. But uh, anyway, hmm. I don't know why they have... Darth Vader. Darth Vader's face, or hmm. at least his helmet... Have you ever seen this kind of an offshoot, not to take to, to detract from what you're saying, there, um, I think at the Vatican or some sort of Catholic building that it's, the architecture is that it's like a snake. There's certain pictures of, uh, huh. of it from the inside where it literally looks like a snake all the way down to the tongue with the red carpet rolling down the middle. Have you seen that? I've not seen that. <clears throat> Look up like uh, Catholic... Oh, I found it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty famous how, architecture. How bizarre! I but it looks like I've a serpent. It. It's, I mean, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty alarming once you see it. <clears throat> yeah. Huh? Isn't that weird? I can see the eyes, maybe on the side. Well, I'm you can sure. see the teeth. Teeth, yeah. In the back. Is this a Satanist cathedral? <laughs> <laughs> Since someone said Catholic, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? <laughs> I don't know. What, what is the technical building? Does it say? Uh, it says is it, it's the Snake Chapel at the Vatican. Oh, it's literally called the Snake Chapel. Yeah. That's huh. what they titled it? Uh, that's what this article titled it. Huh. Anyway, all to yeah. say, depending on when you walk into these places and what's happening, it does evoke a sense of respect. Mm -hmm. I was probably a little bit more respectful with the environment walking into a service. Because everyone is there, and I'm not there to distract anyone. But other cathedrals that, that I've visited, there's no one in there, so I don't need to, to worry about what I'm doing and how I'm interacting with the space, whether I'm supposed to be so many feet from a particular statue, or I don't know what rules there are. I'm ignorant largely of that. But just to say that it influences how I interact with something, it doesn't govern or direct. Sure. Yeah. Same would be true of any kind of technology. It doesn't direct me. I, I decide how to use the technology. But it does guide you. He, was ta he brought it up in the, I think it was the last, last podcast, he was talking about doors and how doors uh, have a tendency to, um, he was talking about bad design doors and how they, it's like, do I push, do I pull? And so creating a, a door that leads you, oh. that directs you sure, yeah. in a sense. I'm not saying it's absolute or that... Yeah. It doesn't force you, but it, that it at least directs you. It follows a function, and the, the function is clear. Yeah. <clears throat> and so that, that has to do with architecture. That has to do with music. Because it obviously, music has different ways of evoking a bunch of different types of emotions. Mm. And the words tend to anchor those sounds. You know what I found interesting about uh, Jesus is King, that album? I don't, I don't typically like rap, um, but when Kanye put out that record and, and there was a couple songs that were kind of like mean. Mean? Uh, kind of. I, I would How say don't put mean? it up, but don't put it up because copyright. But um, okay. mean and they just had attitude. They were like, God is king with the soldiers. He, like he, the way he talks and the way that the, the attitude of the, the song and the the assertion in his tone there it's it's i never really heard anything quite like that in a real way and it and it it amped me up mm. and it amped me up not toward evil but toward godliness toward faith and so i just thought that was an interesting thing because music in and of itself nothing in and of itself is evil oh right? that's an interesting statement well that's biblical nothing in and of itself is evil. I believe Paul says something almost verbatim. Yeah. Huh. Where he says, no thing in and of itself is evil, but rather the heart behind it, right? I mean, that's kind of the point. And I think they were probably talking about eating meat. I think it's in Romans 13, 14. Um, but it's that idea is that we attribute things. You know, somebody, he says to the person that doesn't eat meat, they do so in faith. And to the person that does eat meat and has the conscience that allows them to eat meat, they do so in faith. So whether you eat or you drink mm. and you're doing it in faith, 
you're doing it in a clean conscience, you're fine. It's not necessarily... Now, if you're murdering somebody, that's a different thing. Oh, I did it with a pure heart, and no, probably not. Right? That's an action, not a thing. Yeah. That'd be the, the distinguishing between an object and an action, sure. Yeah. And we've also delved there in, 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 in a few previous episodes as well, specifically art. Can you appreciate art that celebrates things that are contrary to your values? Or truth, really. What do you mean? Well, I've been to several of the big galleries, like a National Gallery in London and then a National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And some uh, of the greatest artists who have ever lived, or uh, maybe what we collectively would probably agree to be the greatest artists, Rembrandt, Renoir, um, Picasso, all these greats, Leonardo da, Leonardo da Vinci, that they paint and and portray uh, biblical characters or even biblical scenes. And there's not necessarily in all of them truth, but yet that's what they're trying to portray is truth or their perspective or perception of it. And so in some cases, it could be a lie. Mm -hmm. Like uh, even how they name some some paintings. Like I think I saw the... uh, what was it? It was it was a painting of John the Baptist being held by his mother and Mary. Uh, I think it's it's a, it's a cartoon, is what it's called. I forget what it was. It's, it's some of you might know what this is called, and you can easily Google it, Google it up. Uh, but anyway, all to say, the way that it's named, we know the people in in Scripture. We know the name. We know. The relationship, and yet we see these artists portray, mm-hmm. and there's a little bit of lying. It's there's no truth. What's your feeling on on uh, images of Jesus? What's my feeling on images yeah, of you Jesus? Know, you well, have... okay, I saw so many white Jesuses in Europe, everywhere in Europe, and I hate it. Number one, to ascribe any kind of image. You mean like to a blonde, blue eyed Jesus? Or like blonde, a, blue a eyed, Jesus? or lo- like a, a longer, slender uh, bone structure, more probably attributed to. Well, he did fast for 40 days and 40 nights. So, I mean, no. I don't know if that changes his bone structure. Oh. <laughs> um, but to just make him look European. Yeah. Or white. I think every culture tends to portray him in their likeness. Taking that approach, maybe there's some sentimentality. Like I walked into a friend's home a few years ago and they're a black couple. And I saw a black, black Jesus. Last Supper. Yeah. So all of them were black. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed that that um you know, but, but yeah, I guess to go back to the root point is what do you think about portraying in visual form? I think it limits him. Yeah. And He's what about so video? He's and wonderful, and I, I'd rather wait to see him. And what about movies? I love The Chosen, but it limits him. Mm-hmm. I love I The found, Passion. I found even praying or singing or thinking about him, like traveling recently, I would have an empty chair in front of me, and I would imagine him sitting there. And I found myself having watched maybe one or two episodes while I was in Iceland, at least, of The Chosen, that I was thinking of Jonathan Rumi's face. Mm -hmm. And I had to remove it. Mm -hmm. Consciously. So, I, yeah, I I, I principally, I I agree, and I actually think it's, I would say, technically speaking, it's wrong. That nobody should do it, even moving for movie format. If I'm going to be intellectually consistent, I think that the no graven image is, is that, and I think it is because it is limiting. It's like reading a book, right? A lot of people made these, th- you know, would say that, like, after Harry Potter, whatever book they would read, that every time they saw the movie, the movie was never as good as the book. Because the, the, the movie f- makes things finite. It, it absolute. Mm-hmm. And in the same way, when you see Jonathan Rumi's face, or when you see uh, Jim Caviezel's face, or you're seeing somebody who represents Christ but it isn't Christ. And so it's kind of almost technically it can become an idol. Technically speaking, maybe not in your heart. You're not worshiping Jim Caviezel or uh, Jonathan Rumi, but 
it's not Christ. He's not Christ. Now it's hard, right? Because you know, plays. I mean, throughout history, we've. I mean, it's the greatest story ever told. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the life, death, burial, resurrection, Jesus Christ. That is the greatest story ever told throughout all humanity. And so, of course, you're going to see plays, you're going to see movies, you're going to see depictions. And though they do evoke us toward faith and godliness, they do, do, do me, as well as the opposite response for others who hate him. That's good. But I will say, technically speaking, to be intellectually consistent, my perspective is, is it permitted? Oh. Hmm. It, it's a hard one. Part of me that loves the perfection of Scripture believes and wants to believe the way that God chose to communicate that precious gospel is enough. Reading it, hearing it read, Mm -hmm. the language used to put the story together, that was enough to make it so beautiful and to inspire the greatest artists. So would you say that it's immoral or it's not right or permitted to depict it? The other part of me who's more creative, imagines a season of life where you want to express the beauty that you feel inside, which I believe art is as an expression of what you feel, your engagement, your experience. And you want to put it together somehow in musical, visual form, or even taste. Uh, Chefs can be artists. But to ascribe it to be something like Jesus or the nativity scene, that's when it's hard for me Mm -hmm. because it's too on the nose. Like create something else, (laughs) be more abstract, or maybe your personal experience, which is the greatest defense of the faith anyway, and the greatest experience to demonstrate is your personal connection to God. I think it's too on the nose to create it exactly as you hear it. So when I hear even worship music, where it's exactly too, too much exactly on the nose, maybe expand it more. What do you mean by that? It's too much on the nose, for, specifically like, with worship music. Okay, I mean, we could talk about this for a long time. When I hear... I love theologically rich music, old hymns. I engage in those because it's intellectual for me. But also when we're told to sing a new song, think of David hiring uh, songwriters, musicians to write psalms, that we can use truth as a basis, but our language, any language, can not add to the scriptures. We're not looking to add to truth. But so much of what we sing is our expression of that truth, our experience of that truth. Uh, Our adoration doesn't have to be verbatim what we read in the scriptures. Like so many of the worship songs we sing in church right now are whatever the writers of that music are experiencing with God. So you'd be more of an advocate for abstract worship in... I would lend toward one or the other. Be on one side or the other. Don't try and be in the middle. So if you're going to be... If you're going to sing the Psalms, sing the Psalms. But if you're going to abstract, abstract. It's when you kind of try to meld them together, and then it becomes a weird theology. Hmm. In my experience, a lot of popular music in the church is a melding together of the beautiful scriptures. I got in trouble um, by singing a Bethel song at a pretty strict Reformed church. It was actually, it was formerly Morris Hill, turned into a different church. But I got in trouble because I played a song called Praise is the Highway. And it's it's a song by a guy, Sean Foyt, sang it first. That's the first time I'd ever heard it. But it's by Bethel, if I'm not mistaken, and um, very rigid church that I was at as far as theologically, they were very strict. Mm -hmm. And um, I sang that song, and it really encouraged me. 
And I imagine this would be very similar to somebody who's like, I watched The Chosen and I, you know, it really encouraged me. I feel like I got to see a side of what Jesus might have been like that might argue, right? And, and it really, it really made me to appreciate him as a mm-hmm. person, as a human or whatever it is. So, I, but in, you know, to make that, I guess, similar to what I'm saying is that I was saying that song because it, it really did encourage me. It praises the highway to the throne of God, praises. And, and so it, the chorus was that, but it, I got complaints. And, um, and the pastor told me, he's like, yeah, that's, that song's heresy. And, um, and, but it was poetry, right? I mean, it's not explicit scripture. I don't think. I mean, maybe it says it somewhere in there. I I'm not familiar with praises the highway as a phrase in the Bible, but it's poetry. Praise is the highway. Which praise God. Because then then you you're, you're gonna if you praise him, then you're 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 positioning your heart toward humility. It's poetry. Into union with your creator. And 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 so in, in my my heart it was I was singing a song to encourage humility and submission to the Lord. Um, but to, 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 be, to a technical and very rigid mind, a very legalistic mind maybe, which I was just portraying in that no graven image type of thing, can be really hard, right? Um, it's kind of like Jesus healing someone on the Sabbath. Not hmm. supposed to do that. Hmm. Well, which was the Sabbath made, for man or for God? Isn't that what he says? Yeah. I'd have to think more on how those are connected, but... I think, I, think, I guess what I'm, where I'm getting to, just by discussing this, is it, it does have to do with the heart disposition. And setting people up who engage with it, explaining what it is. So let's say in a corporate environment in the church, if you're saying we're going to uh, be exposed to or sing along to a creative expression. And this is where it came from. My experience, or the, here in the scriptures, explain the art, because not everyone will, will get it, no matter how beautiful the poetry mm-hmm. is. Just everyone's made differently. And let it be what it is. But to mix it in without explaining it, it can be confusing. Because it's like, okay, am I supposed to think those things? Is that theology? Even though it made me feel good? But if we're going to sing truth, let it be truth and let people know it. We're singing the Psalms today or right now. Or this next song, like you often hear it when we're at church, we have an artist. I wrote this song because. But it's not something that everyone has to sing as an anthem. Let's listen to it. Let's be exposed to beautiful art. And let's engage in some way. But it doesn't have to be muddled with truth. So I think just positioning people uh, can remove any kind of confusion or even uh, any kind of response or reaction that we don't intend from people. Mm -hmm. Just by positioning what we're doing. I learned that at Apple. (laughs) Just let people know what you're going to do. Yeah. That's part Before of leadership. you do it. I've learned that as a parent, because yes. you know, with my kids, it's always to give them kind of a warning. Yeah. Let them know, hey, got five minutes left. Yes. Because when you surprise them, you know, they don't really understand and they freak out. That helps. Um, even still, you know, it doesn't mean everybody's going to get it, but it is important to explain. Sure. Yeah, I agree. But if you've done your diligence, then, then just you've point done back your to job. It. Yeah. Yeah. Just point back to it. This is what I meant by that. This is what, why we explained it this way. And we're, all, we're likely always going to miss the mark mm-hmm. or probably cr- cross the line, but this is where we can talk about it. But we've done everything in our diligence to say, especially in, in art, this is where it came from. And I'm not trying to interpret t- truth for you. I'm trying to express how I felt when I heard this. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. Yeah, maybe that would have helped if I'd have done that in that specific situation, like this song represented this to me when I was in a dark yeah. moment mm-hmm. and it pulled me out of that. And here's why. Mm-hmm. And this is what this poetry represents to me. I hope that it can, you know, be part of that for you as well. Yeah. And encourage you toward life and godliness. 
And people feel <laughs> a connection to it because they see that you're I'm not I'm really trying, bad at doing that. I used not, to especially, but yeah. Sure. You're not trying to impose something that I should feel or believe, but you're telling me this is how you got there? It's testimony. And you're drawing people into probably people who are in a space that you were. And you're saying, this helped me. Mm -hmm. And this was beautiful for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share it. That's yep. what it is. It's sharing. It's not saying, this is the way we sing as a church. Whenever you feel this way, black and white. This was my experience. It sets people from the offense to the more likely to it's appreciate. It's disarming, again, no. yeah. So what, what, if, what if it's something that's explicitly forbidden? Like, give me an example. Thou shalt mean no graven images. Mm. And even if it's still, you know, it's just kind of one of those scruples things that I'm, I'm, I'm chewing on right now, obviously, is what we're talking about. You know, in a show, like, even, you do, even, because the passion's not te technically different. You know, it's, it's a portrayal of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a portrayal of Jesus with Mary uh, going through persecution and going through his crucifixion experience. And it's a depiction. It's in here, and we read it with our eyes, but it's not absolute. What is the morality? Is why would it be? Why would it technically be forbidden in a graven image form versus hmm. other senses or mediums? I guess that's not really a sense, right? I mean, reading something it doesn't necessarily attack any sense. Because you could read without seeing in, in, the, in, the, in the absorption of information. That's all it is, is, is you're absorbing words. And maybe that's just the purest form, and that's the way God intended us for us to ideally consume that story. And maybe that's why, right? But we have an imagination, and that can grow. Like, think about a child. When we think of Jesus saying, unless you're like these, you cannot enter, that a child imagines and it gets them excited. What will that be like? What was he like? And he never tells us, really, I mean fully. No eye is seen, no ear is heard, no mind is conceived. There, there's a degree of wonder always. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, um, like in the Peanuts, where like the, the, the parents are always, wah, 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 and you never wah, really wah, wah. see them. Yeah. There's always like this sense of wonder and this sense of awe, and even in the scriptures, like Isaiah, right? He couldn't even he couldn't even look at God. Like there's always this sense of glory and awe, and and I think maybe that's part of it too, right? Is to maintain that hmm. order and that reverence and that respect, that authority and that structure, to keep that intact as much as possible. I think that's what art does. And the sharing of it. Not all of it does, right? I mean, because some has okay, the intent can. to tear it down. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. some art, literally, the point and purpose of it, the heart behind it is to destroy sure. that, yeah. is to distort that. M you know, most pop music that we listen to nowadays is a distortion of what God designed as pure and right and good. Okay, so then it goes back to that statement you made earlier that nothing is inherently evil. Well, there could be art... That is. It's an object. Well, it's not. So I actually had this conversation with Bree. And to stick by that, we were talking about fingernails and painting nails. Men should men paint their fingernails. And this Ooh, is a, I'm interested in what you have it, to say about this. I was immediately repulsed by the idea. Oh. I was in, in a very yeah. like uh, no. But I have long hair. Yes, you do. And so I, I, it, it caused My grandfather me, would be repulsed by that. Many people would be. A lot of Texas <laughs> culture, and you know, yeah. it's not never been the case here. You know, in New Mexico, a lot of people have long hair. There's a lot of Native Americans that have a lot, a lot of long hair. A lot of hippie. You yeah. know, there's there's a bunch of different cultures that that uh -huh. that that um, that it doesn't represent. There are a lot of categories that don't represent femininity or disorder in the natural function of a man, but these things are symbols. Mm. And symbols are not absolute. 
necessarily like that, right? Cultural symbols are not necessarily absolute. For example, Scots wear kilts. Scots, right? Scotland? Yeah. Um, that's a skirt in I other cultures. I never cared for that personally if I had to throw in my... Uh, you what? Yeah, sailor, I never cared for the whole kilt situation myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You love guys in kilts. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like that's technically speaking, that's a guy in a plaid skirt. Which in our culture, in American culture... There's not a category for that that makes sense to us. It mm. used to be the case with men don't wear skinny jeans, you know, 20 years ago. And when men started wearing skinny jeans, they started that this is where this is where art comes in, right? Where art kind of creates categories within culture and art artists fill those categories with meaning, with what they mean. And so so to go back to the fingernail thing. I initially was like, no, because in our culture, that's what it represents is femininity and rebellion and different things toward natural order. But then I started thinking about it as like, hypothetically though, what if we started a movement to combat that and said, we're going to start painting our, our nails rainbow to symbolize the promise of God and that he You worked. said that. I to Brie as an argument, right? Oh, hypothetically, okay. like, could you imagine a righteous movement to, to diminish the power. Say, say hypothetically, there was a bunch of guys starting to you know, uh, paint their fingernails a certain way to uh, align themselves with femininity or whatever it was. And, and in, in an act of, say, protest, as strange as it might be, as an artistic expression as it could be, Hypothetically, you, you paint your nails as, as an act of protest, as a, oh. an act. The heart is not tainted. And there's also another scripture, I believe it's in Titus, First Titus. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, but it says, to the pure, all things are pure. To the defiled, all things are defiled. And so, it, again, it always traces back to the heart and the intention behind it. You know, if somebody, um, there was a worship leader, his name's Corey Asbury. He painted his nails. He had his daughters paint his nails or really? something. Really? Huh. And, um, and he had to come out with a video about it because a lot of people were like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I, you know, I initially would have sympathized with those people, like, kind of like, that's strange because are you aligning yourself with false ideas, you know, a, a distortion of what maybe God designed things to be? And so, it, you know, don't be too quick to judge. I was. And, and who knows? I don't know his heart. God knows his heart. But the way he, he said it was like, my daughter's painted my nails. And I left it. And if that's all it was purely, hey, dude, I don't see any problem with it. If your heart is pure, I get it. It might make me feel uncomfortable, you know, in the same way my long hair would make someone in Texas or your grandparents uncomfortable. But ultimately, or like a Scott going in a no, t no context going to, you know, a church somewhere. I don't know, you know, it would make some people feel uncomfortable. Like, what's up with that? But it's just a lack of understanding. Because uh, all that to say, symbols, right? Is that's the weird thing about culture is all cultures kind of create their own language. And, 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 our, and we have symbols that represent different things. Long hair, beards, certain clothing, um, certain music. And they represent certain things. So there's a subtext that kind of fills all of these We make them symbols. too. Yeah. Yes, but they're not absolute. They can evolve. They can, and they are. They, mm -hmm. they are constantly evolving. Our language is constantly evolving. Yeah. You know, by saying dude, 20 years ago, was still seen, seen as very disrespectful huh. in culture. But now it's been stripped of all of its disrespect. And that's not to say that there isn't a higher way to approach or talk, but it isn't seen as disrespectful. If you were to like say to, you know, hey man, you know, that would be seen as very disrespectful, especially in other cultures. When I was in Thailand, you, you used your, you know, their uh, cop, uh, if a man, or even bowing, right? And you bow to a, um, an elder, your hands, you, they go up all the way up to your forehead. Like it's, there's a, it's a high respect when you're, you're bowing to like a woman or something and 
there's different levels of of honor attributed to kids. You don't bow, you know, like an, you know, adult would just never kick them. You just kick them. You say, "Go do the dishes." <laughs> Technically speaking, that's that's exactly what it was. But there was that was their culture, their honor system. If you were to stick your t- your foot towards them, they would see that as you pointing your middle finger at them. Interesting. And so, I kind of love that. What? The honor given to absolutely, people. and we have stripped our culture of honor mm. th- over time. You know, um, agreed. And we could totally insert some more of that in. You know, but these things they come out. But sometimes it's not even out of disrespect. I, I would say, you know, dude, I wasn't doing it in a heart of disrespect, but I was also ignorant. You know, I wasn't necessarily trained in, in, in the ways of honor and, you know, respect in the, same, in the same way other cultures might have focused more on those things. So anyways, I, you know, I, 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 that's the case for um, nothing in and of itself is sinful, rather the heart behind it. Right, God weighs the heart. There's this debate that it's on a on a on a, a harmonizing note. Dennis Prager got in trouble recently because he he spoke kind of in his own words on behalf of what generally Jews believed, which was that they don't care so much about the inside; they care about what you do on the outside, your performance. The it's it's more of a a, a their faith is, as he says, uh not performative, but it's based on what you do. And he had a great conversation with Eric Metaxas. Eric, Eric Metaxas just talked at uh, Calvary this last weekend. But he had a conversation with him, not at not the church, but a, but a few weeks ago, on this very topic. Because Dennis, Dennis Prager would believe in the Old Testament, but in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, David, you know, they, they say, God, you weigh the heart. But it seemed like Dennis Prager was, was disagreeing with that. So, you know, I, I just think the scriptures are pretty obvious throughout time, throughout the Old and New Testament, that it's, it's not so much the thing, the thing we become legalistic about, myself included, but rather the intent or the heart behind it, because that's, that's where the, the truth is, and that, that's where the whole Jesus mm-hmm. healing someone on the Sabbath comes in. The Pharisees got really mad at him, and he said... I've not done anything wrong. And he was right. He was perfect. Now, of course, they disagreed with that, but he's our Lord and we believe him. We trust him. Mm. So I think that was the, a great illustration of that. What do you think? I have generally held a belief that everything is distorted. And I don't really believe in good and evil. I think everything because of sin has been tainted and there's nothing good except god the heart is deceitfully wicked who can know it but nothing what do you mean no good deed like someone would say oh that's a good guy he's a good no. guy well yes yeah, so, so you would you would, would total I would depravity say, no absolutely technically speaking absolutely what about a redeemed person anything well, for me okay let's let's let me think about i've thought about this recently being raised by people who are redeemed, they miss the mark, and in some ways they cross the line. I can't hold that against them. They did their best. They did what they knew. And but you would agree that... I agree. Wait, let me, fin- let me finish my thought. And I can look back and say that they, in, to the best of their ability, tried to honor God. Exactly. So by faith. any good thing came from him through them. Through faith. Through them, yeah. Through, well, being redeemed, they're alive now. And, of course, that comes with faith, trusting that every moment when I want to get angry and punch this little kid. <laughs> and I, I was raised by four people, and they disciplined me in different ways. One was a 45-minute lecture minimum. One was a spanking. One was a grounding. And when they just had to tell me they were disappointed and I melted. But in all of those, they missed the mark. And they, in some ways, they did cross the line. Yet I stand here today still. And I can look back and, and we've talked about this. I've talked with each of the people who raised me. And I can't hold it against them. Even the good things that I would say the good things that they did. They missed the mark. 
through them trying their best to live in the Lord, there was some good that came out of it, but it was only from him. I don't believe that any good comes from mankind. Only the Holy Spirit who empowers the believer and the believer who yields to that power can good come from. Yes. Technically, don't disagree 100%. Total depravity, the idea no. that all of sin, all fall short of the glory of God. So all it's all sin, distorted. No, no, yeah, no, not one. All art. None is righteous. All communication. All of it. However, and it always has been since the fall, since the, the, you know, Adam yeah. and Eve. But the promise made to Abraham, this is where, this is where mm. faith comes in, right? Where his righteousness wasn't credited to him by his works, by his righteousness. Mm-hmm. It was by faith good. that he yeah. believed God, and he acted in, in a manner of that. And that's how he was judged. Yes. And that's what I mean by God weighing the heart. Yeah. Did you act in a manner of faith? That's good. Mm-hmm. In consistent, all-consuming faith that, that then did, um, and Jesus says, if you believe in me, you will do as I do. Yeah. If you love me, you will obey what I command. So we, we are imperfect, in our, and our, our deeds will never get us there. And, but that it, that's not to say that God can't employ us oh, agree, by his spirit to do good things. I hope he would out of but my But it life. is not by our doing, but right. by his doing through us. Yeah. That's all I'm saying, by faith. So all that to say, mm-hmm. is everything defiled? Yes. But can we, through faith, um, pursue and live out righteousness? Yes, in increasing ma- manners, uh, in an increasing manner, until we're fully glorified in our new bodies or whatever, you know, when Christ comes and judges the living and the dead, but he, he will come and he will weigh the heart. That's all my point. And, 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 the, and all I mean by that is that is by faith, not by our outward deeds mm-hmm. necessarily. You know, like Jesus goes and tells the guys praying on the street corners, no, go pray in your closets where no one can see you. Because that's where your heart, that's where it matters in your heart. You're doing these things for your earthly reward and you have received your reward in full. That's what I'm saying. It's more of an inward thing. And, and so it, I think that, that we're having a cohesive conversation. And it's actually c- kind of cool because it, it does. It, it, it enters in the sphere of art and culture, cultural expressions. But I look forward to seeing how your three little ones, what they look like growing up, knowing you and Bree. It's cool. What do you mean? It's the way you think. The scripture that's readily in mind, how you both view the world. You're entrusted with three little arrows. Yeah. It's nerve wracking. How are those going to be sharpened and shot? Oh, out? Lord, help me. Help yes. us. See, only what, every good thing comes from the Lord, and I love that you rely on Him. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know I'm, I'm a fallen man, and I, I need the daily yeah. mercy of my Lord. You know, we all do. Hey, real quick, I just wanted to remind you that we're doing a giveaway, and it's ending next Friday, June 16th. The winners will receive one of three items from the Common Trading Post. A Thunderbird feather necklace, a Thunderbird concho cuff, or one of our Fox Turquoise horseshoe rings, bringing the total value to nearly $500 in prizes. All you have to do is subscribe to the Common Union YouTube channel and tag three friends in our giveaway Instagram post linked in the description to the show. We'll announce the winners on next week's episode. Thanks for being a part and helping us share the show. Now let's get back into it. What do you think about these videos that are coming out where they're like deep fakes? What do you think about deep fakes? Where is the inevitability of that? I just think on the front, the affront to truth. When you experience what's in front of you, like for me, watching your expressions as I talk, this is you. But if there's something translating you in the middle of us, I don't know that I'm okay with that. Because we read, like we're social beings. From the time that we connect with another human being, 
we're social, we connect with each other, and we connect with each other more than what we see spiritually. So for me, when I see the implications of anything that augments our inability to connect spiritually without the Holy Spirit, that it's an affront to the Holy Spirit, like AI, because it becomes a power that we rely on that's different from our connectivity we're supposed to have spiritually with each other, where God is connecting us. So when I, when I look forward, uh, it's said in creativity that creatives are an early warning radar system because you can see almost kind of what's going to happen mm-hmm. in the future. Obviously, we don't tell the sure. future. But when I see something like that, I see it's beautiful and I want one. <laughs> to watch movies? That sounds great. Oh, yeah. There's certain things that probably... Having been on a plane, there are great airlines that give incredible experiences. But to have that there or working on a screen, to have a large screen to work on, to edit photos, whatever it is, it sounds wonderful. An infinitely large screen as far as you, you need it. you know. But... Our basic need is to connect. And the people watching that video that I know of in my life that are more connected to technology. So you don't think that, though, because you don't think that, you, well, not sim, we're not simulating. I think AI, if we were to connect with an AI person, like there would, there would be a lack of, well, it's actually, like, there's somewhere we can go with that. But, you know, when you interact with somebody on the internet, you still have a level of connectivity. Only a level. But you, you would say it's not real low. because the essence of the other person isn't, you know, genuinely con- connecting with you. It's really you're just you're just you're missing one of you, one of the senses or a couple of the senses. Like most of communication, it's said that what was writing letters percent of communication is nonverbal. Writing letters has some form of you attached to it because your personality is handwriting. Yeah, but say you're talking to somebody, your voice tone, your tonality, but you're your missing, texture. You're missing some of the other person. I, I would agree it's obviously not the fullness, but are you still, is it still authentic? Um, that word, I think language betrays our ability to f- probably find out that particular use of the language. Betrays our, our ability to find what's really happening there. Because I think we're not really connected. Sitting next to someone and feeling their warmth, smelling their breath, smelling them, feeling them. There's something spiritually that happens there that if you are not regenerate, regenerated by the Spirit, this simulates some form of connectivity. That if I'm on a phone or if I'm praying for someone across the world, the Spirit connects us. So when there's something that is simulating that connectivity without the spirit there that's where i feel the danger because we're supposed to be connected through him so i just i just see the implications obviously the applications so so when paul's wonderful you were arguing though that that if you write a letter you a part of you is still in you in the in the media it wasn't about him He's writing truth. Hold on, no, no. So to address that point, though, so you know, say you, you, you were saying that if, if a letter is acceptable, right? I'm not saying it's acceptable. It just it it's a communicate a little bit more of you because it's from your hand. There's like there's nuances. People have and entire would, degrees. But you would disagree that saying talking on the phone would be as it's a similar. less. I wouldn't say that there's agree or disagree. I think there's less of you that's coming across. You don't think it would just be different? There's certainly different, but also less. Hmm. I think it can be both. Different and less. So I saw this video a while back of someone who lost a lot, like a, their kid or something like that. It was a terrible situation. But they used AI to, and a bunch of previous data videos, and they uploaded this data similar to what they're doing with deep fakes where they get so many podcasts of Joe Rogan or whatever it is, or Joe Biden or anybody speaking, and they have all that data, all that memory, and they upload it into this database, and they can make this person, and so what this this mom ended up doing, I think it was a mom or dad, who lost their kid, to have one last interaction with them. They used AI, they used AI, and they used, um, 
that, whatever is the VR, VR to have a, a, as close of a simulation to that person, it wasn't, it wasn't them at all. It was absolutely, that's fully, well, that's hard because it was an amalgamation of previously. I think there's that evil person. in that. You think it's evil? Simply because you're breaching the nature of grief. The wages of sin is death. And anything that is a front, an affront to that truth and that reality, to say that I can fabricate something to not grieve, to not be confronted with the wages of sin, points back to Jesus. He's the one who will raise the living and the dead. He's the one that will unite all people that trust him. He is how we will be able to see the people that we love who've trusted him. Anything else is an affront to him. So when I think of AI in any way, I think that it is an, a power, like a collective consciousness, a power that we rely on, on more than the Holy Spirit is a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, when he left, said, I'm going to leave someone exactly like me in every way. That's the language in the Greek. Allos, like me in every way. And he's going to be a helper, a counselor, and he's going to teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. John 14. I love the song that's happening in the background right now. Beautiful song. He's living his best life. On oh, meth. But when I think of, so I have friends I was just visiting. I'm not throwing them under the bus. They're typing in this AI how to answer um, an aggressive email. And th these are the parameters. I'm their coworker. Uh, this is what happened. And then it formulates this beautiful answer. The Holy Spirit is the one that should be directing you. Not this combined consciousness. That's a power that we're relying on. Or even he showed me design. That there's a, an AI that can design for you. So, Chorus, we wouldn't have a job. Design for you an image. So, I typed in boy jumping on table with meatloaf and a red balloon. <laughs> so ridiculous and random. And it generated four images. I chose one and then it refined it more. That, I don't, I don't know what the end of that is. The ability to create. We're called co-creators with Christ. That was one of the attributes he gave to us to create. And when we tell a combined consciousness to create something from what was, that takes our ability to engage with our creator, I think. And I think there's so much more, probably, that more intelligent people, more educated people can refute or add on to that. But when I think of my relationship with Jesus and the power that the Holy Spirit's supposed to give me to connect with another human being and to live the holy life that I'm supposed to live with Jesus, anything that takes me from that is an affront to him and an antichrist and blasphemy. That blasphemes his power. Even if it ha has bells and whistles. Even if it has the ability to watch debauchery. <laughs> it's interesting because technology, I mean, there are some people, some tribes of people that uh, believe that photography was wrong and that, it, you know, every time a picture is taken of you, a part of your soul gets snatched from you. Well, that's weird. And uh, there's always kind of... It sounds like Instagram to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. That's why... <laughs> that's why you don't have Instagram. Huh? That's why I don't have Instagram because it takes from me. <laughs> it technically does. It I mean, kills me. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> But, but that's obviously kind of ludicrous, right? The idea yeah. that uh, every time a picture is snapped of you, that a part of your soul gets lost huh. into the photo because your energy and your, you know, there's something, I don't know the philosophy yeah. specifically, huh. but that a part of your soul, your essence gets stripped, taken, stolen from you. And so they would, there were certain people that are just like, you cannot take a picture of me. It's forbidden. It's against my, you know, whatever. 
And it's as if every time when there's a technological advancement and we are seeing them consistently and constantly, it's not to say we shouldn't, you know, be on guard or be aware, uh, concerned. I'm definitely concerned, especially when they in, 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 um, invade our body, for example, right? It's, it's straight out of Revelation. Um, the typical mark of the beast type of thing. We all, you know, in the modern era of always kind of, we've been trained to, it's going to be a chip. It's going to be a chip in your forehead or in your, your hand. Well, I, I do. Um, I'm against that. I'm against modifying. Paul says you shouldn't even tattoo your body. Do you not know that you're, you're, you're a temple of the living God? Ah, oh, man. But, but in a sense, it's I, too late for me. This is what's interesting to me is that, you know, your body is a temple. And at what point do these technologies, or have they already, in effect, defiled us? Um, I don't doubt it. And I think where we are... Does this go back to the heart issue? You know, could you, could you get a chip or could you, you know... You know that this is it's honestly it's, it's, we're gonna we have to wrestle with within the faith it's weird uh ethics or or faith questions that no christian has ever had to consider ever you know and so we're having to really wrestle with um well they've had to wrestle with the idea of the chip thing we've been thinking about that one for a long time but specifically i mean these t- technologies I, I was watching this guy um charles hoskins and he's the founder of uh, Cardano, which is a cryptocurrency. But he was talking about, we are going to see in the next 10 years more technological advancements than ever in our lifetime. And that's saying a lot. We've seen in the last year the onboarding of AI mm-hmm. and its mass adoption, people using it within the last six months. It's taken off, it's exploded. Um, and how that's going to affect and is affecting our society you know, is engaging with, you know, we're having to d- deal with all these different issues. Is engaging with AI, utilizing AI. Is it a tool? How, far, how much is a tool? And how much is ethically wrong? Or does it fil- uh, defile your conscience or whatever? Or whatever. I think it's, it's an interesting thing that we're having to really wrestle with these things. What do you think about Tesla? No, not Tesla, but Elon Musk. He's got that, um, the brain chip. First of all, would you be willing to do that? Explain this. I've only heard it. I've not l- seen it in news. Is there a video? Anything. Maybe it would be fun to do a video. Is this of, a chip that you can put in your brain? It and just what got it approved, do? I believe, by the FDA to, to begin human trials, to begin human um, trials. So they have a chain, yeah, a, tr- uh, uh, a chip. I'm not, su- I haven't gone down that rabbit hole necessarily, but the idea is that you're going to live, uh, the, that you're, you are, you are, Connecting your Ooh. physical body with, um, and the, the angle that they're using is that for people who are paralyzed, for people who have, um, you know, can't, can't move their legs, this has the potential to bridge that gap, to, to, uh, to fix that. And so that's going to be the Trojan horse, if that's, how, if, if that's fair for me to say, to, to get it into societies, they're going to use that moral or that, you know. Oh, we got to, you know, we want to fix people's blindness or whatever it is. So we're going to put a chip in their brain to artificially fix it. But then, then you got the ethical questions like, how much is Botox? Is that an abomination as much as a chip in your brain? Yeah. What about, (laughs) what about cosmetic surgery? You know, all of these different things. Hmm. Uh, What about me getting my feet fixed? My bunions? I've got crazy bunions. What are bunions? They're where you're like... They're like Funyuns, but on your feet. Exactly. They're just really Ooh, smelly, un- artificial onions on your feet. No, they're just... They're like um, your joint on your big... My big toe is like screwed up. It's the it shoes hurts. that you wear. I, it's probably partially because it was also genetic. It runs in the fam. It's the shoes that he wore. <laughs> it could be. And they wore on your grandparents. Here's the implant. That's a, a model of the implant. Let's check it out. I like that it says implant. So we use, you know, we've already in- integrated, like, I, you know, Bree's uncle has cochlear implants to ha- allow him to hear in an artificial manner. He couldn't hear, hear, hear before, and now he's used co- cochlear implants. It's, it's like this, but it allows him to hear. But what does this allow you to do? Is there a, like a... 
The, there's a lot of I like speculative videos that don't, don't really. Oh, so there's no us. like official. No, there was like a seminar they did that's like three hours long. It'd be hard to figure out. Let's watch it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll start it now. Start the, the live. <laughs> um, yeah. What are the main bullet points? I I, I think it just is. It, it's essentially inserting the idea of um cyborgs. It's basically yeah, like you would be able to compute internally. It's it's the Apple thing, but in your body. No. Yeah. What do they call this again? Uh, it's the the company is called Neuralink. Neuralink, that's right. Who's it for? I just quadriplegics. That yeah, sure. That they all this development is only for quadriplegics. <laughs> and that's the limit. That's no. It's never going to go beyond that. Of course, it's not. They need mass adoption to make it profitable. Uh, in the future, we hope to restore capabilities such as vision, motor function, speech, and eventually expand how we experience the world. So yeah, you're right. They're marketing it toward the disabled community first, and then they're basically saying, and then the best see, is yet see, to come. See, it's moral. It's good. Let it happen. And it's hard because it's like, because oh. conservatives and, and you know, Christians tend to, be, tend to be really strict on these things. And I think for you know, cautious reasoning, and they tend to be the least likely to adopt new technologies, tend to be. And that's unfortunate because they're going to happen. That's, that's apparently his logic, Elon Musk's logic, is it's like, it's going to happen. It's an inevitability. We might as well get ahead of it. That's his logic. And so we, we might as well drive it so that, you know, bad forces don't. But who's to say he's not? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to so go. So that the Russians don't land on the moon first. It's an inevitability. <laughs> yeah. okay. Did we land on the moon? Hmm. I wasn't there. Good answer. <laughs> Neither was Buzz Aldrin, if you he asked said the guy. We. <laughs> I wasn't there. Neither was Bu- That's what he says literally in an he, interview, he right? He literally says, he's like, why didn't we go to the moon? And everyone's like, wait. Oh. What are you saying? Yeah. Ooh. That's a can of worms we can't open. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Do you think that these things are... Uh, in your theological view, leading up to the end of time? Anything that augments our depravity. Yeah, of course. The end, the end, or the end um, in, a, in a sort of way? Would you, would you say? Well, like, end is a pretty so like <laughs> absolute the, term. <laughs> it's kind an, of. The like, end. <laughs> well, in Jesus, in Matthew 24, he says, the end of an a- the age, which... I think a lot of Christians interpret as the I end of time. Yeah. But ages, there's multiple ages, right? I mean... Stages. Stages yeah. and ages. But there, there are. And so I guess a lot of Christians... I think that the predominant view within Christianity is that um, the world's going to get worse and worse and worse, and more evil is going to you know, infect the world. It's going to get bad, and then Jesus is going to come back, and, and, uh, and that's what it's going to be. And in Revelation, it kind of alludes to a lot of these types of things, right? Um, Central bank digital currencies, do you know about these? No. So the Federal Reserve is a central bank. It's a privately owned bank. It's actually not under the authority of the federal government. And so by our authority, you know, it's not, a, we are, we pay at interest to the Federal Reserve. But the idea is that, that we'll have a Fed coin, apparently in the summer, that's been announced. Wow. Huh. And... Um, but it's a central bank digital currency. And so in Revelation 13, 17, this was, I was in my show notes that I was going to do earlier. This, when I was in, it was in 2020, I kind of saw the writing on the wall for this type of thing. You saw less um, change. There was no change. Remember seeing news going around? There's no pennies. There's no coins. They have a coin shortage or whatever. And then there was a bill that was proposed in Congress to um, create a digital dollar. And I, and I remember a friend sent that to me and I like, legit panicked i was like oh my gosh because you know i've read revelation and it essentially says that um i'll just read it all right so revelation 13 i'm going to read 15 through 17 he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free or slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then it goes on to say his number is 666. 
And so it's my favorite number. It's it's one of the most famous scriptures, right? The whole world knows of the six six six, and you know uh, the mark of the beast. They celebrate this idea of like, but it's a kind of a terrifying thought. And in twenty twenty, when all this stuff was happening, I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to be removed from society. And sure enough, there was an attempt to do that during the the forced um, jabs. That whole scene was essentially like those who reject it, you, you're, you can't participate in society. There was an attempt to do that. So I, I would say that was the spirit of this, hmm. the same spirit, and, and that it actually, it, it rears its ugly head age after age. This is this idea of, um, and this isn't necessarily biblical, but it's called The Fourth t- Turning. It's a book. And it talks about every 80 years or so that there's kind of this general time frame where you have different seasons throughout a society socially. It's kind of like a, um, you know, you got summer, fall, winter, spring, or kind of like a harvest, right? And that's kind of how I see it, right? And then Matthew 24 talks about this. But, but regardless, the idea of AI, and, and eventually, I imagine that it seems like the writing on the wall, the Christians are probably going to... Um, abstain from the connection of cy- cyborgs, this type of thing. Um, and that eventually that if you're not, then you, you can't participate in society. You can't buy, you can't sell. And it sounds like that's what that was, right? What do you think about that so far? Do you think that that's a, a reality? Do you think that's... Let me see if I'm hearing you right. Do I do I think that it's a reality that we're there? That no, a potential. Let's just say like a a, a viable potential reality in the in the foreseeable future in our lifetimes. Without scripture, if people were just looking at history and reading and watching what's happening, I don't think you need scripture to see that there's an end. That we're only getting worse. This just reveals that there is going to be an end. Uh, and anything that we create that separates us from God and each other will further that end and expedite it. Look at the God's top ten, the Ten Commandments. The first half deal with our inability to love and honor God. The second half deal with our inability to love and honor people. Jesus' final words, one of Jesus' final words to his disciples, to sum up everything, love one another. Just as I have loved you, love one another. Anything that separates us from that love expedites evil and our end. But you, you, so let me give you my hot take on this. I've only heard recently, what's hot take? Where did that come from? It's just like a, it's, it's an uncommon, probably less common take. Okay. I, I want to hear your hot take. I've heard a lot of your hot takes. You have, and I ha- <laughs> I'm always coming up with new ones. Me too. Uh, yes. And so, so my, my, my perspective on this, I used to think that that was like, in the end, that's what's going to happen. And it seems like it, the writing on the wall, you know, and the technology and but my, my perspective now is that it's more cyclical, that it's a spiritual thing that happens within a society of domination, authoritarianism, that wants to clamp down and persecute, punish God's people on the earth, goodness, uh, through his obedience, his faithful. And so, I, but you see, you've seen this type of behavior throughout human history. And the first time that you kind of see this, there's a, there's a perspective within post-millennialism, which I sympathize with, which is an eschatological view that the millennium is now. It, in eschatology, in, 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 in the book of Revelation, the idea that we are in the thousand-year reign. You believe this? I symp- yes, I, I do. I per- I'm persuaded by this perspective. Wow. But that, those people that... that, that carry this perspective, they believe that that number 666 was John speaking in code on the island Patmos because he knew that his letters were going to be read. He had to speak in code. His number is 
666, he was referring to Nero. There's a, there's a large community of people actually believe this. In fact, I think that's the historic view. And that in 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, and all of the animal sacrifices, all these different things that happened, it was the end of the age. And so when you read Matthew 24, which he's referencing Daniel 9, Matthew 24 talks about it. And so as these things surely will happen before this generation passes. And so I have this interesting take where I, I actually believe that. I think that. I think that what Jesus was specifically talking about was in 70 AD, which was, what, 30, 40 years later? 35 years later. Um, and I believe that that did come to pass, that, that he said the temple will be destroyed, not, not one stone will be standing upon the other. Uh, that these were all prophecies of the near future. And he specifically says, when you see these things happen, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, when you see that come into the temple, flee from Judea. Do not come back to get your cloak. He's speaking specifically to them. He's warning them that in this coming few decades, you're going to want to flee. And um, th- so I, I'm, I'm up with that persuasion. However, spiritually, I don't think that that spirit that, is, that was employed in, in trying to extinguish the spirit of God and the people of God, I think that, that rears its head time and time again. And it's actually by God's allowance, of course, his sovereign will. And so when you see things like what we're seeing now with, like, with, with the forced injections and the separation, the segregation of the un and the pure ones, right? The pure and the unpure. It's an age-old thing of those who are righteous to the world and those who are unrighteous, the outcast and who are working by a different, uh, living for a different idol a different God. And I think that we're probably going to see a similar thing in our lifetime, specifically in regards to the financial sphere and central bank digital currencies. We're seeing it unfold right now. And it's actually quite alarming that if you do not buy into the central bank digital currency situation, that you're going to be outcast. You're not going to be welcomed into society. Um, in fact, you're going to starve. You're not going to be able to use cash because we're going to do away with cash, physical cash. That's the idea. It's quite alarming, actually. It's not just, but, 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 but the white pill of it all is this. Though they have tried before, they will try again, and they will fail every single time. Who's they? The people filled with this uh, antichrist spirit hmm. who want to... Um, create their kingdom apart from God. What are you looking up? Uh, Isaiah 60. Talking about the millennial kingdom. Uh, There are certain signs. The the first thing that came to mind were people who were old, advanced in age, we would call them people who live from 70 to 100 uh, Isaiah says, will be looked at as mere youth, meaning people could yes. live longer. I, I don't believe we're in the millennial kingdom. Because um, Christ isn't reigning. <laughs> well, what the, the, the perspective would be from the post-millennial view is that kingdom is now, though it's not an earthly kingdom, it's a spiritual kingdom. And so when John the Baptist come as Jesus referred to him as Elijah, uh, he said, uh, uh, prophecies all spoke that he will come, there will be one before him, like one calling out in the desert. And, the, and, and what John the Baptist was coming and he was preaching, he said, repent or perish, he's saying the kingdom is at hand, repent, right? This was what he was preaching, this was what he kept telling the people. And then Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom is here. And, and, and the idea of the kingdom, we use it impl- implicitly a lot of times as Christians within the faith. It's like to spread the kingdom of God. It's to spread the gospel. And all that means, when Jesus says it, he says, all, it is finished. 
he essentially says, where I go, you cannot go. He says, it is finished. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them of all that I've taught you. And, he, he, and he's commissioning them to go and establish his kingdom, because where he goes is on the right hand of the Father. This is the argument of the postmillennial, which I sympathize with. And so he is on his throne at the right hand of the Father in heaven, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and those who are accepted into the kingdom through faith, it is now. And, and Jesus alludes to this idea too multiple times when he, he, he specifically says, who is in heaven. He, he, he speaks about the kingdom as present. The kingdom is at hand, it's now. And so the idea, it's not a physical kingdom, and this is why he was rejected. Right? The Pharisees didn't want him. To, they, he wasn't their king. They rejected him, of course. But he said, but on his, uh, it said the king of the Jews. Um, we believe that Jesus is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Well, a king has a kingdom. And if he is currently, presently at the right hand of the Father, then is there not a kingdom also? right now, presently? And I would argue, I, I, I would say, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And it's, it's growing, actually. In fact, there's a parable of the mustard seed where he says the mustard seed, though it's the smallest seed, will grow into the biggest and, and will overwhelm the garden, the, the biggest tree and will overwhelm the garden. It's an interesting perspective, but the idea is that it's an ever-expanding and eventually will convert the world. That the seed Jesus planted will convert the world. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, I just don't hold those views. Yeah. I think we're uh, like tying back to all, the, all of the topics that we've covered. We're being groomed to worse. But you would agree that, that the gospel has expanded since the time of Jesus. If I were to look at the last 2,000 years, every human being, nearly every human being, has access to hear or be exposed to the gospel. So if you're thinking of expand, but we're told to go and make disciples, I don't know that the action of living in the gospel has expanded. I think we're only got, we've only gotten more wicked, including the church. I think we're digressing. You know, I think there's an ebb and flow. There's an argument that um, it's like going up the side of a mountain. Sometimes you're going up, sometimes you go a little down, sometimes you're going, and eventually you make your way up. That there are, there are, there are. I think there are birth pains, uh, but I think there are less people living holy lives. Now than ever. Yeah. Interesting especially in the church. Hmm. We could talk a lot about that, but we've been here a while already. Yeah. And our wonderful producer has stuff to do. Has a lot. Hey, stuff don't put this do. on me. If you guys can't duke this out on the show uh, tonight, <laughs> then uh, I don't want that on me. Tonight, <laughs> we there's don't so to much time. Out, but... if, if the gospel is proliferating, then we have more time to expand it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm just. Um, I have more of a. It's hard. It's hard to not uh, um, see it very literally. The seed, which was the truth, the gospel, the word of God. Jesus is the word. Planted a seed with twelve disciples. He said, "Go make disciples." Teach and make them to obey. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and even though there's many wicked, there's many false believers, many come in my name and are not from me. Absolutely, I don't disagree with that. But what I would say from 12 people, it's, it's almost impossible to argue that, the, that, that his message or the gospel is diminished. I'm, I'm, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 2,000 years later, on the other side of the world, and I somehow have come in contact with Jesus Christ through the power of... Oh. You know, and I'm not saying that there have been wicked times and wicked ages, and I think that's why I'm saying this cyclical thing. It's like the strong men create good times, good times create 
soft men, soft men create hard times. And I think that we're in a season of difficulty because of a lack of obedience, but this has happened time and time throughout the Old Testament. Joshua warned against it. They fell. They stopped obeying. In Daniel, same situation. They fell away. They were no longer obedient. In America, we could probably argue the exact same thing. There are many nations that go through these seasons, and eventually God purifies it. He spares a remnant, and he, he uses that remnant to go and, and flourish again. It's just like the illustration of the seasons, right? There's a retraction, and then there is, a, again, another harvest. That's kind of how I see it. I think we would agree. I said earlier, it has every human being nearly has access to the gospel. So in that way, it is proliferated, but we don't make disciples as readily. We're passive. We want the virtual reality. We want to give it to them and say, here, obey. There's less discipleship, and I think there's more wickedness. Otherwise, we wouldn't be warned. A lot of the warnings, even in Paul's letter to Timothy, in the last days, children will be disobedient to parents. I believe that that was a warning within the church, not within the world. The world was already living like that from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think that the church, inside the church, we are becoming more disobedient, following what Dietrich Bonhoeffer would call cheap grace. That it's about how I feel and uh, my ratio of goodness compared to that person's badness. Well, I'm not as bad as they are. I'm not as wicked as Hitler is. But let's look in your home. Everything that you do votes for the world that you want to live in. The kind of food that you eat, the kind of clothes that you wear, the technology that you use. And we in the church will spend thousands of dollars to put within our buildings, for the name of Jesus, something that has enslaved and impoverished and abused human beings on other parts of the world, but because we're so disconnected from them, what's in the name of Jesus? The gospel's being proliferated. Look how many views there are on our podcasts. I think we are becoming more wicked because we are allowing wickedness to come into the church for our comfort and ease and efficiency. It's easier to be disconnected from where your food comes from, where the sheetrock that you used to build the building in the name of Jesus came from, where the metal came from, where your cashews came from. Entire nations would be at war to have land to make plantains for the nuts that you eat. So I think we're becoming more wicked in the church and of course outside the church. And that's why there's a need for there to be an end, because it's only going to be Not more repentance. wicked. Maybe we didn't, I misspoke. I don't know what you mean by that. I don't know. I, I, it's, it, I'm getting kind of like in all, I mean, we're, we're going down, and so we just need Jesus to save us versus kind of what I read in the Old Testament is like we're going down, we're in disobedience. We need to repent. If my people who hear my voice will repent, turn from the wicked ways, that idea. That's kind of, because I, I don't disagree. I think that the comforts, I think that, that um, analogy of um, strong men create good times, good times create soft men. I think we're in a, in a time of, we're, we're standing on the you know, shoulders of giants who've established through hardship and hard work um, the privilege and comforts that we live by today. And those comforts are creating within us ungratefulness um it's more than a hard issue it's a reality it's the people who make those things possible it's the enslavement to have chocolate in our on our counter it's the well, i don't i don't understand what you mean by that like what i mean it's I'm not evil I'm to have chocolate to, right it's not evil to have chocolate it's how you came to have it our ignorance doesn't absolve the sin in order to get it on your table. But because we're okay being ignorant, that doesn't mean we're disconnected from the evil. 
So we're going to be held accountable for that. We have access to look into where the things that we engage with in our life comes from. We have access to that. We have knowledge. That knowledge, when I look at Eden, and one of the the first lies was, did God really say that? He's holding out on you. And you're going to have the knowledge of good and evil. The more knowledge we have, the less we're connected to that knowledge, the more wicked we become. I understand what you're pointing out. You're pointing out that I, we've been disconnected from reality. Yeah. And, and, we're and there's judgment because of that. I'm not disagreeing with, with that. You know, like we process foods. We, you know, we don't have, we're not in touch with the idea of like the animals that are killed so that we could eat. How they're killed. How they're, yeah. And I think that there's a, there's a, there's a, a sense of morality and the things that we get, lo- that get lost in the shuffle there. Um, and so, yeah, I, th- I definitely think that there's merit to that, and it's important to, to, to come in contact with that thing and to, to really decentralize, in a sense. But with such a big society and the, the way that it's evolved, not justifying it, I think, that, I think that what's happening naturally and by God's sovereign will is that it's kind of what happens, is, is judgment follows, and things get hard. Because there has to be an end to it. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're seeing it more like, God, God, and, and, and you know, in a sense... Spiritually, I think that's it could be the, the way too. Is that ju- Christ comes, He judges the earth. It gets hard. Sends us off into the desert, build character. And I think that's where we're at. I think that's what we're at the cusp of, and we've experienced for the last few years. You know, things haven't necessarily been easy. We have, you know, financial crisis looming over our heads. Um, social despair crazy stuff going on, you know, we're, we're, we're in it. The way I see it, you saw it with Sodom and Gomorrah. You saw it with Babylon. You see it with societies that grow great and big and idolatrous. Let's build a tower to heaven. Let's do, and that's what we're doing. You know, we're like, let's be gods. Let's live infinitely. But what I'm arguing is that this is, this is a part of the human sinful nature and that those who are not redeemed are going to pursue that avenue. No. And eventually the Agreed. society will become perverted by it, and God will judge that nation and cleanse it and renew it, just like a season where all of the leaves, all of the branches that were overextended, whatever it is, all the leaves fall, and, and a season of death comes upon a society or the earth. And those characters built over the winter and, and, and hardship. And I think that's, that's how I see it, right? And, and so I don't think it's like Jesus is necessarily, like he could, I'm not saying he won't come back now or any second now, or that there won't be that moment of like judgment day um, imminent. But what, I, what I, I, I see happen throughout time and time again, since the time of Christ and before, is, is a time when a, a society falls away from obedience to God and into disobedience, into all of the societal sins and fallen nature, all of these things that are being celebrated in our society. And what I'm saying is that won't continue. And eventually that will, um, there's a, a rule that that which cannot sustain itself won't and um, it won't, and uh, it's just a temporary season, and eventually we're seeing the fall and the end of an age, and we're seeing a great unraveling, an apocalypse, if you will, and on the other side of it is another spring. That's how I see it. But Everything you just said, I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. I don't know where there was like the miss there. Cool. Let's, oh. let's stop it then. That's awesome. I think it was, yeah. I, That's awesome. I hold, wholeheartedly agree with that. And Thank I'm you. thankful that there's an end. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm so thankful that there's a, a good optimistic one. Um, thank you for joining. Thank, thank you, you for, for having on. me. All right. Thank you, Chorus. Thank you, Chorus. We love you. Love you guys. Love you, bye. <laughs>